Namaste and welcome. I'd like to start our shared reflection tonight with a tale that I heard through Michael Mead. He's a storyteller and it's considered a fable for today. And it begins with a child who's playing with a ball and he's bitten by a poisonous snake. And by the time the parents have arrived, the venom has spread. So the little child's unconscious and with no doctor near, they carry him to a local monk and implore the holy man to save the youngster. The monk declares that he's not the kind of religious person who knows how to heal. In desperation, the parents plead that someone on a spiritual path must have the power to perform an act of truth that can reverse the course of the poison. The monk replies, he says that the only truth he knows of his own life is uh, this, and he places his hand on the child's head. He then reveals that he's long before lost any sense of true holiness and only kept up a saintly appearance while secretly longing for the pleasures of the world. No sooner had this act of truth been made than the eyes of the child opened again. The holy man insisted that the father use his power to tell a truth that could remove more poison. With his hand on his child's chest, the father confessed that though widely respected and envied for his wealth and position, he never felt generous to others or fulfilled inside himself. He owned that he felt empty inside despite all his outer wealth and power. And after this act of truth, the child stood up, but he couldn't stand or move. The father begged the mother to use her power of truth-telling to save their only child. She spoke the truth that she carried in her heart, that her child was the only one she had ever loved and that her marriage brought her no love, that she remained in it only out of fear of reprisals. No sooner had this act of truth been performed than the remaining poison left the child who rose up and began to play again with the ball. He was healed. So what is the, the sense that we can make from this story and one understanding that seems really clear is that this child is really the, all the children of our future and that um, they're threatened by the toxins in our society today, um, the greed and the aggression and the violations that really proliferate when we're not facing truth and speaking truth. And so that the medicine of these times is really calling for us, us, to deepen our commitment to truth-telling, to being honest and real with ourselves and with each other, because this is really the grounds of love. And we, love is the medicine, but to really love, we need to be in touch with what's here within ourselves and each other and, and have the courage to be that realness. And the challenge that we see, and we can particularly see it in, in current times, is the more grasping and greed and the more there's that being caught in that trance of not enough, something's wrong, danger, we need more, the less motivation there is and capacity to pause and say, hey, what's really true? And so part of what's so crazy-making for so many right now is it's like almost in this kind of carnival of, uh, like a funhouse carnival, where all the ground rules have been changed and lies are the norm, to a greater degree. I mean, it's always been there. In fact, I'm talking a bit about how deception is, you know, through the ages. But you can particularly feel today the sense of that con- some conceptual reality we thought we were all agreeing to is that the grounds have, have shifted on that. So it's crazy making. So what is the genesis of deception? I mean, what's behind it? Um, my understanding is that every one of us, until we're free, in some way uh, lies to ourselves or deludes ourselves and deludes others. 
and sometimes we're somewhat conscious of it and sometimes we're not. And part of becoming more free is this capacity to live above that line, to live with more consciousness and speak more truth. But the genesis is that it's a basic survival strategy for creatures through the ages. And it, um, there's three basic ways that it helps us survive. And one is through safety, through ensuring more safety. And another is it that it in some way promotes our self-interest. And the third is it's harmful to others. So if you just take them at one at a time, um, you can see how many creatures use camouflage to protect themselves, whether it's the uh, viruses, and we, we know how viruses, and you know, that's just the way they, they do it. They blend into the environment, not be seen. And I think of the butterfly fish, you know, that has its eye on the back end of its body, so if it gets attacked, it's the, the end of its body that gets attacked, it's not going to be lethal. Uh, and so you can see how creatures do it. And children, you know, a child breaks something and is afraid of punishment. They are going to be inclined to lie about it. So in this story, a woman stays in a marriage because telling the truth would bring uh, too much of a risk, too much of a threat to her well-being. One of the stories I like about deception, because it runs so rampant, a rabbi, a minister, and a priest are playing poker. Police raids the game, turning to the priest, the lead police officer says, Father Murphy, were you gambling? Turning his eyes to heaven, the priest whispers, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. And then to the police officer, he says, no, officer, I was not gambling. The officer asks the minister the same thing, Pastor Johnson, were you gambling? And again, after an appeal to heaven, the minister says, oh, no, I wasn't gambling. Turning to the rabbi, the officer says, Rabbi Goldstein, were you gambling? And shrugging his shoulders, the rabbi replied, with whom could I be gambling? (laughs) (laughs) So one of the big reasons when we're talking about lying to promote our, for safety, is that we lie to cover over what will make us look bad. And that's a pretty universal way that we try to self-justify to ourselves and we certainly hide our vulnerability, our, our insecurity, our loneliness. We, we don't let others know what we think will reflect badly upon us. That's, that's the more subtle but ongoing way we do it. Okay, so number two, we lie to promote our self-interest. And deception helps us get what we want. And my favorite example, garter snakes. Okay, so the garter snake males can emit these pheromones that suggest that they're female. But they only do it for a couple of days after they emerge from their winter dens. And the goal is to get warm, because it turns out that these garter snakes form mating balls of 100 males around the female. So this male pretends he's a female, gets a hundred other snakes to wrap around and warms up, and then once he's gotten his snake hug, he switches gears and slithers off. (laughs) Isn't that a great example? (laughs) So we've got promoting self-interest in that way, and we, we do it in our own ways. We exaggerate our achievements, we inflate our resumes, and um, like in the story, the monk had his pretense of spirituality. And in some way, um, we manipulate to get response. And a child might act sick in order to to get to stay home. So we do things to promote our self-interest. And then the third, harming others. And again, a South American crab spider will, kills an ant, consumes the contents of the body, keeping intact the outer skeleton, carries the empty carcass of, of its own body, that looks like a prey, to attract new victims. So it's this pretense that then allows us to harm others. And we know, if you just think of slander and how slander works, I mean, that slander changes everything. You know, if you, have you set up a pretense that, um, that somebody in some way is bad, even if it's not true, it makes people think, oh, badness is associated there. You get to have people do what you want them to do. This little essay says, how to wash a cat. 
Okay. <laughs> and forgive me, cat lovers, I'm one of you. Here goes. Put both lids of the toilet up and add an eighth cup of pet shampoo to the water in the bowl. Pick up the cat and soothe him while you carry him towards the bathroom. In one smooth movement, put the cat in the toilet and close the lid. You may need to stand on the lid. At this point, the cat will self-agitate and make ample suds. Never mind the noises that come from the toilet. The cat's actually enjoying this. <laughs> Flush the toilet three or four times. This provides a power wash and rinse. <laughs> Have someone open the front door of your home. Be sure that there are no people between the bathroom and the front door. <laughs> Stand well back behind the toilet as far as you can and quickly lift the lid. The cat will rocket out of the toilet, streak through the bathroom, and run outside where he'll dry himself off. Both the toilet and the cat will be sparkling clean. <laughs> Yours sincerely, the dog. <laughs> You know, we often hear the notion that, you know, honesty is the best policy, and you hear it in business a lot, that um, to be honest means, you know, you'll attract trust and confidence and people will keep coming back and so on. And I read a, um, a article in the Harvard Business Review that actually challenges that. It says, why be honest if honesty doesn't pay? We bet on rational case for trust. Economists, ethicists, and business sages have persuaded us that honesty is the best policy, but their evidence seems weak. Through extensive interviews, we hope to find data that would support their theories and thus encourage higher standards of business behavior. To our surprise, our pet theories failed to stand up. Treachery, we found, can pay. And then the whole article describes all the different ways through history, really, that different, um, for instance, many of today's blue chip companies were put together at the turn of the century under circumstances approaching securities fraud. The robber barons who promoted them enjoyed great material rewards at the time and their fortunes survived several generations. The Industrial Revolution did not make entirely obsolete Machiavelli's observation. Men seldom rise from low condition to high rank without employing either force or fraud. And then my favorite example is one of the best liars in history was Eric the Red of Iceland. Some of you might know this story. It's a great one. Banished from his country for three years for killing some neighbors in an altercation, he sailed westward to an unpopulated land that was 86% ice, some of it two miles thick in rock. The only thing that could grow was a little moss on the beach during the summer. Eric claimed the barren expanse as his realm. As he explored and mapped this land, he named many geographic features after himself. Returning home, he enthusiastically urged others to join him in what he called Greenland. They pictured trees, flowers, and rolling hills of grass, which promised a welcome change from Iceland. Twenty-five shiploads of people followed Eric to his frozen domain. <laughs> That's the beginning of Greenland. So I'm taking a little time with this just to cast a, a bigger perspective, which is that through the history of uh, the evolution of all creatures and through human history, honesty uh, was, you know, perhaps a default, but it really worked to deceive. And like all primitive survival strategies, fight, flight, and freeze, um, when deception becomes habitual, when it's not really directly about survival, it prevents us from continued evolution. So for each of us, to the degree that we're not really real with ourselves, or to the degree that we withhold important truths from others, we just can't keep evolving. There's, there's three ways, three major consequences for, um, for living in a way that's not honest and clean. And one is emotional and physical stress, because it actually takes energy, it's a bit, creates a lot of tension in the body-mind, to lie and to maintain a lie. Even when we're not aware of it because we're so familiar, with our persona is used to kind of exaggerating or leaning things in certain directions, the body gets tense with it. 
it perpetuates a sense of an unsafe self, too, because if we're lying, that's coming from a sense of I'm threatened, so it perpetuates that feeling. The second one, which I would think pretty much everyone gets, is that in relationships, if we're not, to the degree we can't be real, to that degree there's not going to be trust. We won't trust because we'll sense that the real me would not be accepted, it wouldn't be okay. That's why we're driven to not being honest. So a relationship can really be assessed by the degree of truth-telling. Okay? And then, of course, you can see it in the larger society that the more it becomes the norm, the more a cynicism and mistrust that's very, very toxic creeps into every institution. The third area is, as I was indicating, to do with evolution, our spiritual unfolding. You know, we, you can't go through a day of robbing and lying and murdering and so on and then come home and have a really good sit at nighttime. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. So the habit of lying, it obscures truth. Uh, when we're in the habit of molding things a certain way, we actually can't contact what's there. And we can't contact the very vulnerability in us that really awakens our capacity for compassion. And I'm going to be, that's the thread I'm going to be following, which is that if we want to have the capacity to speak truth to power, to be in a conflict and have some way of speaking truth that's actually going to move us towards healing, we have to be able to be honest with ourselves and be in touch with our own vulnerability. Otherwise we will not have be empowered in a way that actually helps to change consciousness. So in terms of uh, our evolution spiritually, there's a wonderful way to have the Garden of Eden as a metaphor for, uh, for dishonesty and what happens. And from the Desert Fathers, it's described that they were, they're absolutely committed, this is the Christian Desert Fathers, to breaking the cycle of deceptions which began with Adam and Eve. So mythologically, there's a sense that in human consciousness, we went for this survival mechanism of deception, but we need to grow out of it. And so using the myth of Adam and Eve, one might say that the great tragedy of the fall lay not so much in that they disobeyed. God could handle that. The tragedy of Adam and Eve was that they hid. Far from thinking of themselves like God, they thought of God like themselves, and thinking God could not bear their failure, they hid. So the the Desert Fathers knew that one of the fundamental characteristics of fallen humanity is that we think we can keep things going by hiding and pretending. That quote came from Columbus Stewart. So we sense right from the very, the get-go, that if we perceive ourselves as insecure and threatened, that we're going to latch on to 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 lying and covering over what's true very early on. I remember a cute little story of a, a child goes up in the attic and he finds the family Bible, really old, hadn't been open for a while, he's looking through it and he sees a dried, up, dried leaf in it and he runs downstairs, thrilled, can't wait to tell his mom. He says, Mommy, Mommy, I found Adam's suit. <laughs> So, covering ourselves over. So, what we're really, the frame here is that in our evolution, deception, it seems to be a key stage of, of, of our growing, and it's not the end of the story. Um, in the same way that you think of the brain as, you know, there's the, you know, kind of primitive or survival brain that operates from fight, flight, freeze and deceptions built in there, the most recently evolved part of our brain has the capacity to be mindful of the patterns of deception, has the capacity to be compassionate towards what drives them, 
has the capacity to, from that compassion and mindfulness, live from a real, and speak from a real place of integrity, which fosters connection, understanding. So we're going to look at that and name that um, there's a real strong pull from both our past to get into the, the cycles of lying. And many people are feeling, I've spoken to or saying that part of what they're concerned about, some of the disappointment with the growing kind of a movement that's going on right now to really um, try to bring some more healing to our society is that in a way, the way they describe is both sides, and this is regardless, and this is not um, partisan, it's like everybody is participating in spins. It's, it's not one side or the other, and to respond in kind, to feel something that's violating and respond in kind with making others the enemy and creating their, their own spin puts us all playing on the same field of consciousness. To raise the consciousness, we need to be coming from a place of compassion and honesty. So we'll be looking at that on the individual level because it takes commitment. Because there's a pull when we get insecure to in some way rosy up what we're saying, to some way cover up things. I find that for myself it takes a real um, conscious intention to stay right, cleaving really close to what's exactly real and to practice it. So we're going to look at how to be more real about our own vulnerability. And by the way, this doesn't mean that we have to announce on Facebook to everybody our most vulnerable, you know, it's not that. (laughs) It's where we feel that there's a, a sense with others that there's a mutual commitment to getting real. How do we play that edge more? Because I don't know anyone that can't benefit from examining that edge. Now, some people use over-express their vulnerability, but the intention isn't to be real, it's to then get attention and be the designated patient. So it requires a real honest attention on how we can be real and have our intention be to really deepen understanding and care, really clean. So again, I want to draw from uh, the Desert Fathers. There's, I think there's just a lot of power in this model because the Christian Desert Fathers talked about radical self-honesty. And it's a very exciting path, like when you start saying, wow, more than feeling comfortable, I really want to know what's true. I really want to be honest with myself. There's something incredibly juicy and enlivening about that. So they call this honest recognition of the thoughts of the heart, that we're beginning to examine the thoughts of the heart, the stories and the beliefs and the emotions that we might not want to be feeling, that we don't like the way they make us feel about ourselves. And they're described as demons in the sense of the the shadow side, they're the patterns of the false self. They circle around a kind of misguided sense of a limiting self. So the way they practice this radical self-honesty, which again I think is is really quite beautiful, is that the monks would start identifying these shadow patterns and they'd bring them to an elder that they trusted called the Abba, A-B-B-A. this personage would really represented a kind of um, accepting presence for the process of self-knowledge, but it was a way of naming it out loud. And uh, quite different from confession, which was this sense of, I have sinned for, you know, if something's bad, forgive me. This is, hey, this is what's going on and I want to deepen my understanding and will you hold it with me? And it said, this is the way they describe it, when the heart is open to the light of truth, when there are no secrets, the demons have nowhere to hide. They cannot begin their crafting of obsessions and illusions, which keeps the the false self going. 
We become more transparent and divine light shines through. So this is the same process that we're doing in meditation. And you might sense that you're cultivating that awareness that like an elder can bear witness without judgment. You're cultivating an awareness that's kind and present so that as you shine a light on the patterns that have evolved around of that, that kind of false self, the insecure self, you can begin to shine the light with a real steadiness and just bring it into the light of awareness so it no longer has a stickiness that makes you think, I am that. I am that insecure self, I'm that jealous self, I'm that competitive, aggressive self, I'm that judgmental, controlling self. Instead, you're resting in this awareness that can see it, and then there's nowhere to hide, there's no way that it grabs your, your energy and reconfines you. It takes practice. You know, we teach a lot about meditation, you know, just sitting with our own being. It takes practice to begin to really stay with and name it and to bring it into the relational context, which I think is absolutely essential. To be able to shine a light here and say what we're touching to others is what really frees us. Because if you can do that, the last bits of shame that cling to what's there begin to dissolve. Does that make sense, if you can say it out loud, that it releases the shame? Yes. Yeah. We've got one yes. <laughs> Thank you. So that's part of the process, really, the healing, awakening process that we see in 12-step groups. I think it's part of the power of 12-step groups, that when we start collectively naming the shadow, we have our eyes on it and it no longer grabs our identity. It's the power in the Buddhist uh, tradition of our spiritual friends groups, they're called Kalyana Mitta, spiritual friends, where there's a meditation and then we share the, f- the fears of a relationship that's breaking up or addiction or ch- raising a child, we, we share what's going on. So again, it takes courage because what we encounter in there, it doesn't feel good and it makes us not feel good about ourselves. You know, I remember the first time I went to a retreat, I was um, at the Insight Meditation Society in um, Barry, Massachusetts, and there was a little um, sign and it had a quote from Lily Tomlin and it said, self-knowledge is not necessarily good news. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's hard, it's hard to embrace these very hard-wired survival reactions we have to grasp after things. Anybody that's dealt with an addiction knows it feels ugly. It makes us ashamed. And it's hard to deal with the fact that we get aggressive. The anger is very real. Every one of us has a nervous system that's designed to feel anger. And we're designed to feel embarrassed about things. So we can get, it takes a lot of courage to hang in. And what really can make a difference is if we can see those patterns and in some way send the message, okay, you belong. You know, you're part of the design. Everybody else is designed the same way. This is not defining me. It's just part of how these body minds are wired. And if we can say that, we can keep shining the light of awareness on what's there. So a story about this kind of truthfulness with ourselves and the, the power of it. Some years back I uh, was working with a, a a man who had who'd come to some different uh, meditation classes and t- told me what at this incredibly painful uh, 
conflict he had gone through with his sister. They had been very close growing up, especially because their parents divorced, so they kind of teamed up and, and really hung in for each other, had each other's back. And as a teens, they did a lot together. They kind of both called each other kiddo. That was their nickname. I, I, they, he told me about how they went to Audubon camps together and they're really into bird watching. And they're just a real team. In her early 30s, she started dating uh, a good friend of his and a colleague. And then those two, the two men, had some real bad blood come between them. And, um, but his sister married his kind of ex-friend, and he cut her off. It was like in some way uh, the, he couldn't overcome the feeling of being betrayed. And this estrangement between them went on for 12 years. And uh, she regularly sent him cards and email messages and kept trying to keep the channels open, but he completely cut her off. Then he got very sick. He had some stomach disorder and it was a real scare. Um, I think he had, might have been some form of cancer, I can't remember, but it was it was, he was told he'd recover, but it was a scary one. And um, some months after he got better, uh, she received an email from him and it said, Hey kiddo, it's migration time, how about going bird watching? So I asked him what turned it around, like how, what was his process, because I am very drawn to stories of reconciliation. I, I can barely read them without, or hear about them without crying, because it always seems so tragic that humans get separated and so much like um, some part of consciousness and some real grace when we reconnect. So I wanted to know about him. And he, he said, um, well, after being sick, I, I just wanted to take a fresh look at my life because I knew that, and I knew that part, if I could do anything differently, it would be to drop my grudges. And um, it's because they seem kind of petty in the face of mortality. And he told me it wasn't only his sister, Beth Ann, but it was also um, a lot of other people. Because he said he was touching the deepest truth, which is what mattered was love. But he said to be available to actually go along with that and drop a grudge, that was a different matter. And that's where the truth, being truthful with himself, had to happen. And so his entry was, he, he was just had to be with himself, and he felt this, like, this resentment that had been festering and bitter for so long in him. And he began to practice, as, as, as many of you know, the practice of RAIN, which is really mindfulness and compassion. He began recognizing and allowing, okay, so it's here. I'm feeling bitter, I'm feeling betrayed, it feels irrational, but it's just here. And then as he investigated, he found it coming from this really young place that felt very wounded, that basically believed, I'm not special to anyone. The one person he had felt special to had betrayed him by being with his ex-friend, so I'm not special to anyone. And a real feeling of shame and unworthiness wrapped around it. So like, he felt like all these years he'd been holding on to resentment so he would not have to sit down into the shame and uh, deep grief of, I'm not special to anyone. So when he could see that, it wasn't difficult for him to offer care to that young boy who felt that. Um, and as many of you know, when I put my hand on my heart, it's, it's a gesture that some people find is really helpful when you get to with recognize and allow, you're noticing what's going on of the RAIN acronym. With investigate, he was discovering the young child who didn't feel he's special to anyone and the grip of that. And then the N of RAIN is to nurture. It said that it's, we're not survival of the fittest, we're survival of the nurtured. So the lying let him be fit enough, he could get through and not feel his vulnerability. But it wasn't until he felt his vulnerability that he could nurture, self-nurture in a way that then he could be with her. And he said, it was a shift in my whole sense of myself. It was like I went from being the 
angry person to being the very young, abandoned person to being this kind of compassionate presence that could be with that young place. So he said, he told me, as it turned out, when, he, when I first met her, when we first hugged, the, all the tears and the pent-up caring just washed away. And the only thing between us was the binoculars banging on our chests when we were hugging, which is, I thought was really cute. But the, the truth from this t- for me is that if we want to love well, we all have ways of creating distance. We have to be willing to be with the vulnerability underneath the ways that we create distance, with that vulnerability that we're avoiding. So I thought maybe I'd pause here and I have one more piece I want to cover with you after this, but do a brief reflection that's a little bit of that practice of self-honesty. If you just take a moment to come into a posture that lets you be alert and relaxed. Take a few full breaths. And you might scan your life for a relationship uh, that matters to you, where you sense some, some separation or some distance and you know that uh, there's not a full, honest exchange there, where either you are defending and holding back something and not saying something because you're afraid or... Um, or you feel like you're misleading or exaggerating or so like either covering up or, or not really being as real as you could be. The beginning of rain is to simply recognize and allow what is there. It may be a sense of uneasiness or um, mistrust or fear, confusion. Hurt. defendedness, whatever, whatever, whatever you're noticing, whatever you're aware of, we begin by recognizing and allowing that to be there. So you're just beginning to witness right now, a kind witness, just noticing what's happening. So the beginning of this radical self-honesty is just to shine a lens on the a light on this relationship and then let yourself bring to mind a particular situation perhaps when you're together and you're with that person and you're aware of that distance or that lack of realness. And investigate a little. Just like this man did, he went under and he sensed, you know, so what's really underneath the resentment? Or to investigate and sense, you know, what, what's underneath this distance or separation? Is there a place in you that's afraid or insecure that if you are more honest you'll be rejected or you'll create anger and it'll be frightening? or sense that the other person won't want to go there. There's kind of a fear of going to an edge and you won't be well received. A fear of looking bad. Fear that you might be taken advantage of if you expose yourself in some way.
So just to, with some honesty and clarity, sense underneath the separation, underneath whatever you're withholding or not saying or uh, whatever is creating that distance, just to sense the human vulnerability, the hurt, the fear, your own unmet needs. As if you're offering that to an elder, offer that to this awareness that's here, just letting it be held in something that's awake, it's kind of an awake and compassionate space of awareness. And it's helpful to put your hand on your own heart so you're really offering compassion to the part of you that feels vulnerable or insecure, that when you imagine going to that edge of being more real, it feels scary. Just to not, you're not pushing yourself to anything, you're just offering kindness, you're acknowledging, okay, vulnerable. And just sense who you are when you're offering care to a vulnerable place inside you. You might sense what possibilities open up, what choices open up, if you can be with the vulnerability honestly within yourself. What then becomes possible with others? And perhaps there's fresh choices available. Adrian Rich writes, an honorable human relationship that is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is a process of deepening the truths they can tell each other. It is important to do this because it breaks down human self-delusion and isolation. Deepening the truths that we can tell each other. So that's a direction, and you can open your eyes. Um, that's a direction, and as we know, it's not necessarily wise to deepen the truths in situations that are unsafe, and it takes a certain wise discernment to sense what's the time and what's the relationship and so on. So it's not a, a kind of a sweeping, you know, we should all be playing the edge all the time. And to deep and loving, we need to be committed to examining this, each one of us. Um, as I mentioned, the most challenging edge of truth-telling is when we think we're going to show something about ourselves that's going to make us look bad. We're really afraid of looking bad. Um, so remember our three friends, the uh, minister, priest, and the rabbi? They're back again with another story. <laughs> so they go for a hike on a hot day and since, in addition to the gambling now and then, they like to go and do a little skinny dipping in a small lake. And secluded, they take off their clothes, jump in the water, and then they go and pick some berries while they're enjoying their natural freedom. But as they're crossing an open area, who should come along but a group of ladies from town? Oh my gosh. Unable to get their clothes in time, the minister and the priest cover their privates, and the rabbi cover his, covers his face, and they run for cover. <laughs> so the ladies have left, and the men get their clothes back on, and the minister and the priest both ask Rabbi Goldstein, why did he cover his face rather than his privates? So he responds, I don't know about you, but in my congregation, it's my face they'll recognize. <laughs> So, there are different times it's appropriate to be revealing. And <laughs> uh, so I, I shared uh, Adrian Rich's quote on purpose because that's the one that um, has affected me a lot in my own life, the sense that the correlation between 
loving, unfolding, and deepening truth-telling. So I, I very much practice that with my husband Jonathan, and we, we have, you know, twice a week we have times where we meditate together and we have a process of, of asking some questions and being with each other, and one of our questions is, there, is, is there anything right now between us that's in some way creating distance or separation? And that's the opportunity to you know, could be, we could be talking about something that's going on between us or something going on in ourselves that we haven't really shared that would be helpful to name. So uh, last year, um, it, one of the things that came up for me was um, the background is that I'm um, a super Luddite in terms of anything cyber and anything mechanical. I mean, even down to the point, if, if a package is hard to open, I'll have a hard time. And back in the day of CDs, you know, that were wrapped, I don't know how many other... How many of you had trouble opening up CDs? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not completely alone. But organizing files, um, following instructions, putting in the new water filter, anything, and it seems like this massive roadblock, and um, I often back off. And so Jonathan and I joke about it a lot, and, um, you know, he has, a, he, has, he has fun with it. But I realized last year that um, it was growing. My sense of incompetence was growing, and it's getting older thing, that I was... My terrain was getting smaller, and I was not trying to do certain things that seemed hard really quickly, and just leaving them for him. And feeling self-conscious and embarrassed about it. You know, it's just one, in addition to losing words, I was just becoming less competent on the earth. And so the joking, there was some edge in me that felt bad about myself. And I remember how hard it was when I knew I needed to say that, because I didn't want to draw his attention to the 10,000 times a day that I was actually bumbling around. And because to say I was self-conscious about it would then add our, our focus to it. And how important it was to say it. Because the truth is, I am getting less competent. I mean, it's just, it's part of the way this body-mind's aging. I am forcing myself to do things that I feel like, oh, I can't do this. Oh, okay, try. You know, just do a few more rounds. But to name it out loud help to reduce the shame and identity with it. And to be able to share it now, I wouldn't have said it out loud a year ago. I'm in the fortune position I get to share with you, my, my spiritual community, and it actually helps, again, it's not like me, it's just part of the kind of conditioning going on. Um, it made such a difference to say it out loud, and then of course it increased every time Jonathan and I are take the chance to be vulnerable, there's deep in connection and trust. I've seen it in personal relationships over and over again, and I see it even when it's not so people that know each other so well, the power of being real. Last week, a, a friend that attended here, a uh, woman from the Middle East, Muslim, I asked her how she was doing, and there were tears, and she's just described the panic she's living with right now about, you know, all the, all the policies and deportation and so on, and how she'll go to work and, you know, feel it and feel agitated, and people at work will say, oh, come on, you're overreacting, and how much that increases the isolation. It's so important to be able to speak our truths and have it be held, because if I could just say to her, I get it, I can really get why you're scared. And, and share, I, you know, I'm not very many degrees of separation from many, many people who are really immediately threatened. And so it's very much in my nervous system, the fear. Um, to be able to speak the truth and have others get it is part of the healing. The belonging that's there makes such a difference. So that's part of our job right now, is to create a climate for realness, both receiving and sharing. One of my dearest friends, Sherry Maples, is a a, a Buddhist meditation teacher. And last fall she got into a horrendous biking accident. 
and uh, we didn't, I, for a while I didn't think she was going to live. She lived, she's in a wheelchair, and we don't know whether she'll be able to walk or not. Um, she has a long ways to go. Uh, this last weekend, she uh, and she's had two outings. She's been in, in a hospital facility for five months now. She um, went and gave a talk um, to a hundred people last weekend for the first time. And the talk was an expression of vulnerability in a loving space. And it was both a heart expression of what it was like to have to have friends there 24-7 because if she pressed the call button people might not come and she was having such trouble breathing she was afraid she'd die. The vulnerability of that to the vulnerability of being with a medical professional who wasn't really listening to her and feeling powerless and what that was like. The kind of humility that she had to face to be able to be in a wheelchair, in public, Um, with that much feeling uh, like her entire life has changed and in that grief of it and having to know that she's going to be grieving more in different ways. I share this because part of the power of that talk was she was transmitting the courage to be vulnerable. She made it more permissible for the field that was there. And it's when we have that courage to contact what's within us, it wakes up compassion. And then, and of course, where the soul leads is we get to be in our larger community and speak truth, have the courage to speak truth, but it's not coming from unexamined anger, it's not coming from unexamined hatred, it's coming from authentic caring, which is the medicine that will truly change our bigger society. So we started with the boy being bitten by the snake and there is huge suffering when truths are buried. Huge suffering. And it's going on for many of us in our personal lives. We can feel where the distance is. And it's going on in our larger society. And if we want to change, as Gandhi said, we have to be the change. So my prayer is that each of us will commit to whatever degree works for us to deepen that radical self-honesty, to shine a light on what's true, and to see where we can bring it into our world to increase the loving. So let's, we'll close again together tonight with just a very brief reflection. Susie Kassam says, being truthful is the new beautiful. Taking a moment in the spirit of this radical self-honesty, this truthfulness, just to sense what's true for you right now. What's true in your body? What does your body feel like right now? what's true in your heart? What's the mood, the emotion, the weather of the moment? And what in this moment is the prayer, the longing that's most true for you? Take a moment to feel the the heart's longing. How is it you want to live this one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver says? The sign of Truthfulness is a kind of sincerity where you feel innocent, clear, tender, and real.
Namaste and blessings. Thank you.